when we began the sermon series last week on the, the faithful family, uh, fitting, fitting what I'm calling a, a biblical frame. The, the, the mental image I have here is, is a picture frame and family portraits, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But we began last week talking about emphasizing the role of mothers in the family, and we saw that biblical snapshot uh, of God's framework for, for mothers. And, and today we're going to take what we might call a, a larger or a broader look at the family, family relationships, and the significance of, of building the right foundation, or, or maybe rebuilding on the right foundation, a biblical foundation. And this week I came across is in my study a, a quote from Dr. Tony Evans, and um, I shared that with you in, in the bulletin, and I think it'll be on the screen as well. There it is. Uh, Dr. Evans says, If your house has a damaged foundation, it doesn't matter how much spackle you use, cracks will keep reappearing. In the same way, a family can't succeed. A family cannot succeed. There's no success if you aren't maintaining its foundation. So here's the thing. God wants to build strong foundations, strong families with, based on his his eternal, his unchanging truths of his word, the, the foundation. And so I hope that this series will remind us as we work our way through it that, you know, we're broken people. We just are. And, um, and, and as broken people, we realize that, that God is, is the architect. God's the designer, and, and he has a, a, a framework with which he's put together, this is what I want family to, to be like and, and look like and act like. And at the same time, he recognizes our brokenness. And so not only is he the great architect, you know what else God is for us? He's the, he's the, the local handyman. And, and he, he's in the process of, of fixing our broken lives and our broken families and broken marriages and relationships. And sometimes, you know, speaking of, of family portraits, I, I know what my family looks like um, in, in the beautiful frame that, that we have on our living room wall. That you, if any of you had the, the, I think it's the company's Life Touch. Have you had your Life Touch, you know, photo? And so I, I know what my family looks like in that photo, but have you ever wondered what does my family look like to the rest of the world? Maybe sometimes we get a little over, you know, concerned about those things. And sometimes I wonder if my family might look like this. Here's a family photo. You know, I, I just, you know. I know what my family, but what does the world think my family looks like? Or maybe, or maybe this. Maybe that's what, you know, that's, maybe that's what the world sees in, when they look at us. Um, but you know, it's not so funny when we think about our text today. And I want to share with you the, the last verse of the text we're going to cover. The very last verse is Proverbs 3. 33, and it says, The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but, is ble but he blesses the, the dwelling of the righteous. So there, there are two words that we're going to key in on today. Um, that, that we're going to consider in, in light of God's portrait of the family. The, the curse 
and the blessing. Now, the first thing we have to deal with is this issue of the curse. When you hear that word, what, what comes to mind? You know, I think voodoo, witch doctors. Have you ever seen, you know, the cartoons and the old, uh, some of the old programs that, um, I remember this Gilligan's Island episode. Now, I'm dating myself. Gilligan's Island was just the greatest show ever you know, when I was a kid. But you remember the, the, the episode with the witch doctor? And they had all these little uh, miniature figures of, of all the, 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 the crew that was you know, stranded there on, on the island. And, and, and they had the, the, the pin, the needle, and they would you know, just stick. And, you know, is that what the curse is like? Is that our image? Because think about it. This text says the Lord's curse. So sometimes do we get this image that, that God has this little miniature me and, and a, you know, a, a needle in one hand, and, and, and is that our concept? Is that our image of who God is? Unfortunately, you know, there are a lot of people in this world that have that concept of God. The big man upstairs who's, uh, you know, just waiting for you to do something wrong, and, and he's going to get you. Um, I think that's exactly what the devil wants people to think. Um, but is that the real picture we have of God in Scripture? Well, we have this text, the Lord's curse, but, but what is the, the, the portrait that we have of, of the, the God we serve in John 3, 16, for God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only son. In 1 John 3 and verse 1, Scripture says, See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. Again, in 1 John, the next chapter, in chapter 4, here's a more lengthy text, but listen to this portrait of the God we serve. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever lo loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not uh, know God, or does not love, does not know God. Why? Because God is what? Love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so what? Loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because we, he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever or whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe. The what? The love that God has for us. Why? Because God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. That's the picture of our loving God. That's the picture that Scripture paints, the God that we serve. So why do we have then this phrase in our text in Proverbs 3.33, the Lord's curse. Well, first we have to understand the, that this phrase is balanced with the second half of that verse, with the phrase, but he blesses. But he blesses. So is God really the, the, 
big man upstairs waiting to waiting for you to mess up so he can zap you some kind of horrible disaster or, or, or some tragic event in your life we, we do know that God unleashes tragic events we could go back to the, the Exodus story and, and the ten plagues God allowed that to happen. Those were tragic things. Tragic, terrible plagues in Egypt. But um, along with the curse, there's always the potential of blessing. So as we look at our text today, we're going to discuss some of these issues. And we're also reminded from the book of James that when we covered that text, we were reminded of how our attitude makes a difference. When, when we talked about trials and testing and the things that Norm was singing about a moment ago, we have the blessing that we can call on him. And so, when, when bad things happen in our lives, in, in our personal lives, in our, in our families, do, does that mean that we're just under this, this curse? You know, we're, we're the Adams family, and no matter what we do, we're, we're just cursed. Well, don't ever forget the promise of Romans 8.28. That even though we live in a fallen world and bad things happen even to good people, God is working all of those things together for our good, for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So don't ever, don't ever forget the fact that, that God is, is working and that, that good that he's working in us is, is that we would, we would go through some sometimes tragic events and difficulties in life for a purpose of becoming more like Jesus. Verse 29, to be conformed to the image of his son. To have his mind, his, his thoughts, his character in us. And God does that as he leads us through, yes, trials and, and testing and tribulation of life is that God's curse often it's his blessing to allow us to experience and go through things that that will stretch us and strengthen us in what Paul says in the inner man in the spirit so that our spiritual lives are, are stronger than, than the flesh that's always wanting to fall to the temptation so we have the curse. We have thing. And you remember like our study of, of the Edomites and Obadiah that we just wrapped up. The, the curse of God was on them because of their unrighteousness, because of, of sin. That's where the curse comes. The, God's curse is a curse on sin, on rebellion against him. And so we have a choice to live. You know, we, we've come across this, this choice, this curse and blessing many times in our study of, of Scripture and and, and what we recognize is, is, is you have a choice. I, listen, I firmly believe in free will. Because of the guarantee in Scripture that you have a choice. And let me point this out to you if you're confused on that issue. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Moses is writing, speaking to 
children of Israel before they enter the promised land. And we studied, you know, verse by verse through Deuteronomy a couple of years ago. But recall this passage. At the end of Moses' life, just a matter of months before they're about to enter the promised land, Moses calls the people together. And filled with the Spirit of God, he preaches some sermons. And this is part of that sermon. He says, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. And the curse if you do not obey the command of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. And, and then later on in chapter 30, again, he is preaching a, a sermon to the people. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and a curse. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. If I don't have a free will, I don't have a choice. But God has given me a free will and a choice. And he tells me to make one. Choose life that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him. For he is your life and the length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Choose. <laughs> Cursing, blessing, Where, which one do you want? Well, make a choice and then live in that choice. What God does is present, pr pronounce a curse on sin, which is essentially disobedience. That's what sin is, to, to disobey God's Law, his command, his how, how he said in his word, this is how I want you to live. The ultimate curse is, of course, eternal separation from him in a literal lake of fire. We talked about that a few weeks ago. The Bible calls that the second death. So we can either turn from sin by turning to Christ, the Bible calls this repentance, right? And, and we trust that Jesus, Jesus took the curse upon himself. He paid the price. He paid the, the penalty, the, the consequences of, of our curse because of our sin. He bled and he died. He was nailed to a cross, suffering the weight of the sin of the world on himself Literally, as he bled and died for our sin. And for the first time in all of eternity, there was a separation between God the Father and God the Son. And Jesus said, My God, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because the curse of sin was on him. You can trust in the atoning sacrifice. You can live under the blessing. Now, you don't deserve it, and I don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. But it's the, the blessing we can live under when you choose to follow Christ, or you can choose to live your own, do your own thing and live under, live under the curse. The choice is yours. I, I can guarantee that if you, if you trusted in Jesus Christ, you are no longer under the curse. You're not. Now, in our flesh, sometimes we live as if we are. And that's why Paul encourages 
the believers in the New Testament and us as well. Don't live in the flesh anymore. Walk in the Spirit. When you choose Christ, here's what happens. You get by default the blessing that He earned. You get by default the the forgiveness and the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit to create something brand new in you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, and He made you alive together with Christ Jesus. So the designer, the, the architect of the family is also our handyman ready and able to to put this thing back together to put the broken pieces of your life of your family back together but yes there's still satan there's still the adversary still busy doing what he does he's the thief he's come to steal kill and destroy But I want to live in Joshua 24. Verse 15 says, And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, if you think that's a bad thing, well, then make a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers, the God of your fathers, I'm, I hope I didn't say that plural. The God of your fathers, actually, it is plural. <laughs> because he's, re- he's referencing the fact that some of their, their fathers had gone astray. He's not talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at this point, because that would be a singular God. You can serve the God that your fathers have, have gone after, Or you could, uh, let's see, the, the, the gods that your father served where? In the, in the region beyond the river when they went astray? Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you, you dwell? But as for me and my house, we made a choice. I've made a choice. We will serve the Lord. Remember that quote earlier from Dr. Evans, when he says, your, if your house has a damaged foundation, it doesn't matter how much you spackle, how much spackle you use, there's going to be cracks that keep reappearing, and in the same way, a family can't succeed if you aren't maintaining its foundation. How do you, here, here's, the, here's where we're going to wrap this up. How do we then, if we want the blessing and not the curse, how do we maintain the foundation? So let me go back now a few verses. I read for you verse 33 of our text, but let's back up now and read uh, from verse 21 on down through 30. Again, Solomon was writing this letter to his son. And he says, My son, do not lose sight of these. Uh, Of what? There's a whole list of things we're going to talk about, but the first two are keep sound wisdom and discretion. That. They will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you, when you lie down, your, your sleep will be sweet. Anybody need some sweet sleep? <laughs> Verse 25, do not be afraid of sudden terror or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Verse 27, do not withhold good 
from those whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow and I'll give it when you have it with you. Verse 29, do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Verse 31, do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked. So don't go there. Don't be that. But he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. What Solomon's doing is he's painting a picture for his son and his son's future and his son's family. What do you want your house to look like? A house that's living under the, the blessing of God or under the curse? So, so how do we do that? Foundationally, what, what do we need to do to secure God's blessing, to, to maintain the foundation? Five things that Solomon mentions here. And this is not an exhaustive list. There's many, many things that we need to do foundationally but here are at least five things out of this text that Solomon encouraged his son to be sure that he did the first thing was to keep sound wisdom and discretion keep sound wisdom and discretion what is wisdom we talked at length about that back in the, the book of James in our study there when James says, if you lack wisdom, well, well, ask. Go to God. He'll give it to you. But what is it? What is that wisdom? Let me remind you, we discovered that, that wisdom is not just knowledge, but it's specifically the knowledge of what's right and wrong and the ability and the will to do the right, to do what is right. That is godly wisdom. Know what's right and wrong, but choose the right. And you're exercising godly wisdom. What is discretion? Well, discretion is, I mean, it's good judgment. It's, it, it's called being level-headed. That's what that word means in, in the original text there. Uh, good judgment, sound judgment. You want God's blessing? Well, sure we do, right? Then, then seek wisdom from above. James chapter 1, we talked about it, exhorts us to practice being level-headed. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't be reactive in situations. Seek the Lord. Trust Him. Listen for His voice between what's right and what's wrong and then do what's right. So be discerning. Have wisdom. That's a foundational element of your family. But there's something else that Solomon says here. In addition to, to building that, that solid foundation on, on the Word of God and the principles of God, the wisdom of God, he says in verse 25, another principle is don't fear. Do not fear. Why? Because fear is the very opposite of trust in the Lord with all your heart. You remember verse 5 and 6? The kids quoted earlier. You can't live in constant fear and at the same time be living under the blessing because habitual fearfulness is in opposition to rest and the peace of and faith and trust in God. I want to read that again to you. We need to get that. There's a lot of fearful Christians. Worry and worry and worry. And I'm afraid. I'm fearful. I'm. What does scripture tell us about fear? Don't do it. Fear not. But let me read this again. Remember to be discerning. Well, let me back up. You can't live in constant fear and at the same time be living under the blessing 
because habitual fearfulness, which, by the way, is a sin, when Jesus says, don't worry, he says, don't do it for a reason. So when we live habitually under a fearfulness, it is in opposition to the rest and peace and faith and trust in God. You cannot have both at the same time. If you have a problem with fear, listen, we need to talk. We need to talk or you need to find a good Christian counselor. That's what I'm here for. And that's what godly Christian counselors are for. If that's a habitual issue in your life, you need some help with that. And with God's guidance and the Holy Spirit working in your heart and and some godly wisdom, you can work through fearfulness and not live in that every day of your life. You don't have to. It's a crack in the foundation that God wants to repair in your life. Okay? So don't live in fear. And get help if you think that you are. But there's a third thing that Solomon mentions in this text. In addition to keeping sound wisdom and and discernment and not to fear don't fear verse 25 in verse 27 he gives this admonition do not withhold good it's just another biblical principle that we need to build our families on we need to teach our children look don't look out just for yourself you be helpful you be hospitable you help others if you have the ability to meet a need, Solomon says, then, then don't even wait till tomorrow. You know, meet that need. And I'm going to add a caveat to this. Because while Solomon doesn't deal with this issue, sometimes we, we get caught up in, in kind of being you know, do-gooders to, to everybody. Some of us just kind of have that natural tendency, that, that gift of mercy can be a dangerous thing in the life of a believer in some ways. Because we're commanded to be merciful, but sometimes you can, you can actually do more harm than good. Let me explain what I'm trying to say here. So if you have the ability to meet a need, meet it so long as it's not enabling another person to continue to live in their sin. We're not commanded here to be enablers. And that's a dangerous place to be as a believer. We want to do good. We want to help. We want to encourage. We want to, to give and support. And even as a church, as a congregation, we have to be careful in this area because of our benevolent ministry. You know, people come, people call. You know, I can't pay my bill. I've got this problem. I've got that problem. Health issues, you know, have, have you know, sucked out our, our, our finances. And now we, you know, we, we can't pay the light bill. So, yes, we are compassionate. And we want to help in every way that we can. But sometimes you, you begin to see a pattern. And, and, and if at some point you say, now listen, we need to get you some different kind of help. You need some spiritual help here. Because there's a pattern that's beginning to develop. And if we just keep pouring money into you and pouring money into you, we're just enabling you to, to keep things you're doing that, that are getting you in the trouble that you're in. And some of you know you got family members like that. you got to quit enabling them. You just have to. And that's part of that wisdom and discernment because there's a fine line there. Do I help because there's a necessity and a need? Or, you know, do, do I draw a line in the sand and say, you know, we got to stop the, the madness. we got to address a spiritual issue. So keep sound wisdom. Keep going to the Lord. Be discerning under his wisdom godly wisdom don't be afraid don't be fearful and, and do good but keep in mind that we have to do that wisely as well but here's the fourth thing do not plan evil verse 29 says and here's the thing people misbehave people do things to hurt us sometimes, I mean, maybe even unintentionally and sometimes intentionally, we get hurt. And so people will, will treat you wrong, even, even family members. Ever been there? 
We probably all have. But the command in Scripture is to leave vengeance to whom? To the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And if God's declared that his job, well, I don't want to have any part of it. Lord, you go right ahead. You don't take it upon yourself to, to get back at them out of spite. If there's gross misconduct, especially if there's legal things that need to happen, if there's you, if someone has hurt you in a way that, that is ungodly and unethical, immoral, you know, God forbid, you know, we, we even talk about things like rape and incest and, and the horrible things that can happen in family life. And if that has happened to you, well, you don't, you don't go here and say, well, I, I won't do anything about that. God, that, that's in God's hands and, and vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You need to tell somebody and legal action needs to happen. That's just, here's a way that God does vengeance. If you go to the New Testament, Paul describes for us the reason God created government. Now, he didn't create it to do what a whole lot of our government's doing these days. But at the end of the day, God established government for our protection, to protect us from evil and to punish, the second thing, to punish the evildoer. That's part of God having established government to take the vengeance for us. So while we, we don't plan evil, we don't spitefully get back at someone, if someone has done something to you, you don't just go back and say, well, that, that's in God's hands now. There, there, there are reasons why we have laws and, and, and government. And, and if you need help in that area, we, we can get you help. The last thing we'll, we'll talk about, the fifth thing that Solomon is encouraging his son to lay out as part of his strong foundation in, in the Lord and in his word. Um, here, here's, how, here's my interpretation, verse 5. Don't envy the bully. Uh, the, text, the text says, do not envy... A man of violence. What is that? A bully. Don't, don't envy a, a bully. Those who, who seem to, to get their way by pushing others around. You know people like that. They have folks in the family like that. Not only don't, don't envy them. Don't, don't, envy means I want to be like that. I want to have what they have. Not only does he say, don't envy him, he says, choose not to follow in his ways. Don't envy the bully, nor choose to follow in his ways. Verse 31, bullying really bothers me. It's ungodly, and that in itself is enough. And, and I have a tendency to be for the little guy. Um, bullying bothers me. Some people literally don't know how to function outside of bullying. And they bully to get their way. Some people think they can even bully their way into the White House, and that bothers me too. Some who are in the White House think that they can bully the rest of us into accepting boys can go into girls' bathrooms. That is a bullying tactic to get their way. Listen, it's one thing for a corporation to impose on their customers a, a, a policy that allows men to have access to women's restrooms and fitting rooms 
It's one thing for a corporation to do that. But I can boycott Target. In fact, I have. I've signed the petition, and I encourage you to go online and do the same. Personal, you know, uh, matter of conscience on your part, but my conscience is clear. I can avoid shopping at that store. I can avoid even driving in the parking lot. My car won't show up there until policies are changed. Um. I can avoid going there because I, I know that it's my obligation to protect my wife and had, if I had little girls, to protect them and my sons, for that matter. I have that obligation. So it's one thing for a corporation to do that, and I can boycott them, but it's another thing altogether when the federal government is literally forcing every public school in America to adopt the same ungodly, indecent, immoral, supposedly transgender bathroom policy that Target Corporation has adopted. That is just wrong. That is my tax dollar at work. this time is take a stand for our families and I encourage you to call your your state representatives and I, I encourage you to, to, to call whoever you need to call it and, and stand up take a stand against this atrocity the Obama administration is forcing on our children our little girls we're not going to stand for it I encourage you to light up the phone lines. We need to let our school system know, our superintendent know, we're not going to stand for this. And if we lose all the federal money in the world, then we'll just make do. That's what North Carolina said. Look, if the federal government doesn't want to give us uh, money anymore to, to fix our roads and federal dollars don't come in, that's okay. We'll make do. We'll find a way. And that's what we're going to have to do. We can lose all the federal funding. That's fine. Find a way. Do the right thing and don't be bullied by federal governments telling you that boys can go in your little girl's bathroom. It's just not right. And this has nothing to do with the gender confused. They call them transgender has nothing to do with that issue. It has everything to do with the fact that perverted men and young boys can take advantage of that policy, whether it's at Target or in the public school bathroom, to take advantage of that and scar a little girl for the rest of her life. And I'm not going to stand for it. And if you need information about who to contact, I can get you that information. It's real easy to go on the website and look up you know, our, your, your Alabama uh, representatives for our area, for our state, your, uh, your senators, your congressmen in Washington. You, you let everybody know. We are not going to stand for this because our families are at stake. And we're going to, we're laying a biblical foundation. And we're not going to stand for anything less than that. It's what you get when you choose to live under the curse. And we need a great awakening in America like never before. Well, let's draw this back home again. It's our families at stake. It's, it's us. It's it's our foundation. How are we going to build on that foundation? Let me encourage you one more time to keep sound wisdom and discernment. Keep going to the Lord for godly wisdom. Don't fear. I'm not living in fear over this issue. I'm just going to do something about it. As for me and my house, 
we're going to do something about it. We're going to serve the Lord. So I'm not going to live in fear over it. And I'm not going to withhold good for those that need it. But I'm going to draw a line for those that I may potentially enable to keep living in sin. And that's where that discernment comes back. And, and I'm not going to plan to retaliate out of, uh, out of a sense of getting back at someone, out of spite. That's not godly. But I will stand up firmly for what's right. And I'll fight for what's right if that's what we need to do. Not out of vengeance, but I'm standing on the firm foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'm not going to go the way of the bully. I'll consider other people's needs and, and not force myself. But at the same time, that doesn't mean I have to back down for conviction. That's not bullying. That's just standing firm on the Word of God. Is that the, the foundation that's, that's worth building in your family? I hope so. That's what we need to teach our children. These principles to live by. Let's bow. Father, thank you again for...